Welcome, everybody, to a brand new episode of the Jams Tea Podcast, where you spin the jams and spill the tea. And this week, we're coming at you, finally, with two actual reviews for two new 2022 albums. The year has finally arrived in its fullest capacity, because we are reviewing two albums from some particularly big artists. We're going to be talking about the newest mixtape from FKA Twigs. We're talking about Capri songs. And we are going to be talking about the newest project from Earl Sweatshirt. We're going to be talking about Sick. We already talked about some rap songs, this previous project, uh, last year, by the way, if you want to go check that out. So go watch that if you want to know our thoughts on it. And as you might have guessed, we have a guest today. We have a longtime viewer of the show. We have April today with us. Woohoo! And we have April not just to discuss these two brand new records, but also for this week's Record Club, which is my selection, where we're going to be discussing the Titanic two-hour double album from Progressive Metal Legends, Maudlin of the Well, Bath slash Leaving Your Body Map. And it couldn't be a record club from anyone other than Riley. Like, it, it just... <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm kind of showing my ass a little bit there, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so that's going to be really, really fun. If that is news to you, you've never heard of that before, go and check it out because it's one of my, spoiler alert, now one of my favorite albums of all time. And uh, yeah, it, it's going to be a really good conversation. But before then, let's get into our regular programming. If you missed it we have put out in the last week some really great videos as well last week we talked about the new record from the weekend and we talked about the latest record from japanese math rock band trico check that episode out if you missed it we also did a fantastic record club on uh two albums actually we discussed a benchmark time in music history which was the summer of 1966 when the Beatles released Revolver and the Beach Boys released Pet Sounds we did a great video where we talked about those two albums and that particular moment in music history go and check that out if you missed it and most recently Zach and I had a really great conversation about the new Sean Baker movie Red Rocket a incredibly entertaining and deeply uncomfortable movie in equal measure and we wouldn't expect anything less from Baker and if you have seen that movie or even if you haven't because our reviews are spoiler free check out the video and um, we really get into some interesting sort of ethical and moral questions as well as talking about Baker as a filmmaker in that video so it's deserves a little bit more love and attention so check that out if you have not stan mikey saber i that's not the word i would use (laughs) anyway as per let's get into our main segment of the episode which is what we have been listening to in the past week jake what have you been listening to over here in my side of the, the the United States of America, we've had a lot of snow this week, and we have been snowed in at various intervals over the course of this particular week. So I've been spinning a lot of music that is like, you know, just suits that mood, that vibe, that little aesthetic of like staring out the window and there's a bunch of fucking snow and I can't fucking leave. And uh, so naturally my go-to snow album uh, is basically the album version of my go-to snow movie, which is Nick Cave's Murder Ballads, uh, uh, which is makes a great pairing with uh, Quentin Tarantino's The Hateful Eight. And it's funny just because I believe at some point last year, Riley took note of the fact that Nick Cave's Murder Ballads is the album we have mentioned the most on this podcast that we have not covered, which I think is still true. Yeah, um, I believe which probably is. is. Which is why I made it a record club that'll uh, be in the front half of this year, just because that's, I mean, there's just no shortage of things to say about murder ballads, frankly. Um, It's just an obscenely fun album. Uh, It's basically, you know, it's the follow up to Let Love In. So you have Nick Cave playing at like the height of his weird ass post punky sound play thing. Like that's the really cool thing about murder ballads is that it's like playing into Nick Cave's central inclinations of as a storyteller but also the music on it is really fucking weird um and awesome and he gets fucking kylie minogue on there to do a duet which is maybe my favorite song on there but regardless uh i mean it's a and it was a hit too like it was it was a commercial success that song 
you know if like i guess that makes sense just because that's easily like the most accessible like you know you could play that song you could play that song for your mom and you know she could listen to it whereas i think that maybe uh stagger lee might not have been as successful of a film of a uh, a charting song or maybe not o'malley's bar just you know maybe maybe not a 14 minute song about uh just continuous cycles of bloodshed uh yeah that album is um not a terrifically uh upbeat listen um as most of nick case albums tend to be uh but still i have a lot of fun with it which i guess says more about me than it does about uh the album but um anywho i gave a first listen an incredibly fucking overdue first listen uh just because i checked out uh, a canonical record from this uh, particular artist last year and loved it and basically at the uh, sort of behest of Riley saying how much uh, you enjoyed one of their albums so I finally listened to Herbie Hancock's Head Hunters that that's a that's a mouthful Herbie Hancock's Head Hunters say that 10 times fast but I mean unsurprisingly it's like oh this is one of the best jazz albums of all time yes it's one of the best jazz albums of all time that that motherfucker could play a keyboard goddamn I'll I'll never I'll never forget that little wee riff from that song it's, chameleon it's so fucking hot like there it's amazing how like i said this about um i think the album i listened to was sextant last year and i have similar thoughts on it in the sense that it's like how like um how much of a pioneer herbie was as like a, a textural like musician in like the engineering sense of just like there was just no jazz albums that sounded quite like this even then and like 10 years on from from then it basically it's just like it's just a peerless uh exercise in his brand of, of virtuosic skill um I, also I think the on my only jazz fusion record that I, that has a song that opens with bill summers blowing into a beer bottle for over a minute that's true i mean and look they make it sound really fucking good. I'm not gonna lie. I was just like, oh, what the fuck is what is where, what's this? I uh I kind of fuck with this. But yeah, I mean, I need to dig through some of his other albums, like Empyrean Isles, shit like that. Yeah. And I mean, just you know, I, I'm trying to make an effort to listen to more jazz just because I listened to to so much last year, all in like a contained two-week span that I kind of burnt myself out on it. And now I'm like, I need to go back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, April, you're a you're a pretty big fan of Herbie, aren't you? I like, I, you could say that. Yeah, no, I like Sexton quite a bit. I think it's one of the most forward thinking albums I've ever heard in my life. I can't name yeah. anything that sounds like it. And weirdly enough, compare it to Autecker, maybe? Yeah, I, I, that's I what I was thinking. Comp a couple of times. Yeah, the cool thing I love about Herbie, particularly the 70s era, because the 60s era is awesome, but like in a completely different way. But like mm. he was one of the first artists, like this was obviously the jazz fusion era, but he was one of the first artists to really like pull in like super electronic textures into jazz music and like put them at the forefront of his compositions as well. Like it's still unmistakably jazz on albums like Sextant and Headhunters, but like the, the, the primary textures that you hear when you put those records on are electronic textures, are Fender Rhodes keyboards, are synthesizers that he works with. They are primarily electronic, which, you know, for early 70s jazz fusion is like really exciting and adventurous and new. And mm -hmm. of course, Herbie, who was heavily inspired by Miles Davis, then Miles would take the... Um, the flag from there and incorporate a lot of electronic textures into albums that he was doing at the time at the same time as well so yeah for my money like I don't know if there's an instrument in the entire on the entire planet to me that has a sound that I like love more than the Fender Rhodes piano like the electronic hmm. sort of keys the keyboard tone that is and yes. particularly Herbie's keyboard tone as well like there's just something about it that is so immediately it's kind of like just triggers something deep within my brain that like just releases a flood of dopamine every time I hear it. I listen to in the vein of kind of newer stuff is that I gave a listen to something that you and uh, August have been talking about an awful lot and so an artist that the podcast pays a lot of attention to generally speaking that would be the uh, EP 
uh, Anti Dawn by Burial. And uh, neither you, at least at first, I know you kind of amended your own opinion in a later what we've been listening to, but August was similarly kind of uh, tepid on it. But uh, as somebody who really, really liked the more spacious, ambient shit on the uh, 2011 to 2019 compilation, I loved Anti Dawn. I loved it from fucking like from the first second to the very end this is like I- i'm glad that this is like an ep that's simultaneously like album length but it also is kind of like it, it feels like a digression for him as an artist that was specifically made for me and so like if he doesn't focus on the inclinations of his sound that specifically appeal to me in his next project that's really not going to bother me as much so it's like i'm glad that this sort of exists as it's like oh i i have this now this is just like i don't have to wonder like oh what if he actually just kind of sat down and made like a more ambient but still like soundscapey kind of you know vaguely garagey you know thing like those first couple of tracks on the compilation and now i have that it's like it's ornate but it's not busy it's it's lush but it's not overcrowded it, it's the perfect balance of his sound and i just like w- whenever i have a free moment where i just need something to sort of soundtrack my thoughts or just to relax or something anti dawn has been perfect um so yeah uh there's a bit of a a dissenting opinion because apparently people aren't really all that into it but it's got like a i think it's got like a 3.10 on radio music that's about right which is which is pretty harsh it's it's pretty harsh for that website yes anti i think anti on's like wonderful and I also like the earlier tracks on Tunes 2011 to 2019 more. So no, yeah. absolutely. And like I like the other parts of Burial Sound too. Like I also listened to Untrue again and even liked that more than I did previously, which I mean I really did, which it also finally clicked for me. Uh deep podcast lore. Um the uh burial song that August uses in his uh Travis Scott video uh that little segment and i was just like oh that's in mcdonald's oh yeah. shit that, Fuck. Yeah. that yeah. i get it now <laughs> like, it just made me laugh a little bit in retrospect yeah um um yeah um, like w- one thing i'll add to the i've already spoken at length about this ep um but one more thing i'll say that i really love about it is that like like that those early songs on tunes like despite the fact that this is like really sort of deconstructed as sort of soundscape, it's more than music. There's a sense of progression there. Like by the time you get to the end of the project and the last track, it feels like you have arrived somewhere. Uh, even if the journey has been like a really sort of nebulous and unusual and kind of like uh, one where you don't like bound by gravity or whatever, like you, you do feel like by the end of anti Dawn that you've arrived somewhere and like, that's almost that almost sneaks up on you, I think, with the last track on that EP, and then you w- go back and listen to it again, and you start to appreciate more and more how Burial gets you there. And it's not a linear journey; it's one that's kind of going in all directions. And yeah, it's just gorgeous stuff. And there's little moments. It's it's an EP of moments, I think. Like there are moments on that EP that will just stop you in your tracks, and then Burial will move on to something else completely. And so it takes a little bit of adjustment with that kind of formlessness, but man, it's, it's super unique and no one else is doing is playing with sounds like that in that way that I'm aware of. Yeah. Like, I mean, this is something for that I could see appealing to people who just didn't even vibe with previous stuff of his, like, it's just a completely different facet and he's exercising that. And I really appreciate it. I, like it's difficult to like sell your love for something like this without being a hyperbolic or b just kind of spouting nonsense but like that journey you're alluding to that's why i love that's why i love and value the compilation so much is that like we talked about that in the video we did on it is that we talked about the the journey and the like the audio visual experience that it sort of ends up being in the sort of nocturnal imagery that everything begins to evoke and that's just literally all of antidon it's just the exploration of a liminal space through sound and it's amazing um right on. uh on 
on the less uh, esoteric side of things, I've been listening to, I, I probably mentioned listening to this artist's like biggest or like most acclaimed album in a, in a, like a past episode, probably a long time ago. Um, or maybe I didn't, I don't even remember, but I've been getting really into the music of Nick Drake. Uh, I really, really loved uh, Pink Moon when I first heard it. That was sort of the first album that I listened to of his. And, you know, that's a really easy album to recommend to people who want to get into folk or singer songwriter or just anything like that, because it's, you know, not even 30 minutes long. And it's just like, it's produced flawlessly. The songwriting itself is great. And Nick's voice is amazing. And like, that's just a perfect, like, time burner album like whenever I need like I need like 30 minutes of my time eaten up right now I'll just kind of like play that and I've just done that dozens of times over the past year like I love that album and I just like I think I listened to Brighter Later one time last year and like I loved that album uh but then I just sort of like I just kept going back to Pink Moon um which is weird just because Pink Moon's like he only made three albums but uh it's the outlier of uh, his work really in that it's really simplistic. It's sort of like he's often compared to the music of Elliot Smith and Pink Moon is kind of his uh, either or in the sense that it's like his most stripped back kind of thing, even though it basically sounds flawless. Like every fucking guitar tone on Pink Moon is just like the most comforting sound of all time. Um, yeah. But I also cool. listened to uh, his first album, Five Easy Left, which is unsurprisingly great. Um, I will say that's probably my least favorite of his stuff as of right now, even though I more or less love it. It's just more like, I don't know. I think the direction he was going was more interestingly explored on, on Brighter Later, but it's this really ornate kind of lushly arranged uh, album that feels a little bit more, you know, it's like, it's just a little bit more dense. Like it's, is, it's more of the, on the Elliot Smith comparison, like uh, I'd say that Five Leaves is similar to something like Figure Eight and uh, Brighter Later is more like EXO. Uh, if you're looking for comparisons like that, but I still I'm listening to various compilations and sort of like B-sides albums of his that were released uh, like way posthumously that have a bunch of songs that didn't appear on any of the albums just because they're very well regarded uh, yeah, and so very much enjoyed well worth those. digging into it. A lot of great songs that didn't end up on either of those albums. Yes. In fact, my favorite Nick Drake song is Black Eyed Dog, which is on Time of uh, Night, which is just such an eerie song. It has this kind of like amazing funereal song. sort of uh, Neil Young-esque vibe to it that I really love. My favorite Nick Drake record is probably actually Brighter Later. It used to be yeah, it's my second Pink Moon, but Brighter Later is really kind of like, there's just songs on that record that are so like such beautiful like baroque chamber folk music yeah that is so like ornate like pink moon for me is a very specific vibe i have to be in a particular mood to listen to that record because it's just nick with an acoustic guitar and it's just some really kind of haunt ha these haunting so songs mm -hmm. but brighter later has this kind of like just sort of a range of moods that spin through it and of course it has northern sky on it which is my second favorite oh. Nick Drake song but um yeah that anyway my favorite i mean fuck anyway That's yeah a, uh, amazing amazing records um april I, do you have any thoughts on nick drake i love nick drake i i can't describe how cool it is to hear someone else say brighter later is their favorite nick drake album because it has always been my favorite and i love pink moon don't get me wrong but like there's just something that isn't matched by any of his other albums that you find on brighter later it's like acclaimed and stuff and everything but like it's notably the lowest rated of his albums on like rate your music and stuff and i just can't believe something like that like again it's a very highly rated album but i look at the score disparity and i'm just like R really that that one are you are you sure like i have that and pink moon at the same rating i think they're both like masterpieces but i i just i kind of look at that and i'm a little bit bewildered frankly no, notably it has like half the number of ratings that pink moon has which is just telling uh, me that fewer people have heard it which is strange you know that record is super super 
I don't know, it feels like this absolute refinement of the stuff that he was doing on Five Leaves Left before Pink Moon is just this kind of like totally. epilogue to his career that ended up being like the sensational record that people gravitate towards. But yeah, I, I think people think of Nick as this kind of, you know, sad singer songwriter with a guitar in his bedroom. But that kind of comes from Pink Moon, whereas it, he, what he mm-hmm. was more frequently than that was he was this really talented arranger of gorgeous sort of instrumentation that you know incorporated strings and horns and all sorts of these you know pretty sort of orchestral instrumentation he was really good at refining and using instrumentation that went beyond just his acoustic guitar and yeah that's I I think I imagine people are people don't necessarily see that side of him as much which is you know a shame lastly i'll kind of blitz through just two things here just because i wanted to give them a mention in that i listened to my next cocteau twins listen was the one you mentioned uh head over heels uh there's really nothing to say other than that shit blew me the fuck away like it's it's like hey what if Susie and the banshees was like chamber poppy and it's like yo like it's the most post-punk inflicted cocktail prod twins project i've heard thus far and it only benefits from that it was astonishing from start to finish like there's like like the 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 closer is amazing and um yes uh sugar hiccup of course one of the band's most popular songs flawless song um that's my favorite favorite. cocktail twins song on an album oh Um, that's oh that's a fucking i mean like it would be my favorite if not for the song that comes right after it which is in her angel fucking yes uh god that's uh that that's that's (laughs) that's something else oh and five ten fifty fold as well uh oh my god just that that's an album that just like it's not as like traditionally pretty sounding as later cocteau twin stuff because those are like you know, obviously this is a very like studio heavy album, but this is just like, what if we made all our instruments sound so amazingly large that you just like fell in them? And it's like, oh, okay. I like that. The, the most recent thing I listened to, I just needed, I, I have to do a lot of driving uh, recently. So I put on uh, different CDs uh, uh, all the time. And the CD I put on today, because it's like the perfect duration to listen to exactly once going to and fro where I need to go is Rush's album Hemispheres. Oh God, that's a God. I I mean, like that was, I think that was my first Rush album. And in many ways it probably shouldn't be. Uh, you, You should probably go with the more traditional moving pictures or whatever, you know, something that doesn't begin with a 17 minute long prog rock odyssey that's technically a sequel to yeah, the ending I, song on a farewell to king i was gonna say like i can never because my, my the way my brain is i can never just put on hemispheres because mm-hmm. i can't listen to book two of sickness yeah. each one without listening to the first part of it so i think like i mean talking of the mortal and the well album we're going to review today you might as well treat mm-hmm. like farewell to kings and hemispheres as like a, a double album thankfully i don't like that 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 itch is not as aggressively bad with me that said i put that album on and i'm just like i'm like how did i ever doubt that this wasn't my favorite rush album because it totally is um grace under pressure gives it some pretty stiff competition i'm a big I'm i'm a devout fan of that one and I'm also a, a big 80s Rush defender. Thankfully, most people on the podcast are, uh, as we should be. That said, uh, I mean, this is just like the peak of progressive rock as a genre, honestly. I mean, Alex Lifeson is just like on on the bookend track specifically. I mean, he was, he's always doing good work. He's like the best guitarist who's ever lived. But in book two and in the final song the instrumental especially the instrumental there's just this part where getty is trading like the, the like getty and him are trading bass and guitar solos and it's just the sickest shit you've ever heard man like and not to mention cygnus book two the the intro track 
that's that's the best rush song i i love it Ooh. so much it's it's so ambitious the storytelling is enrapturing there's that sort of part in the narrative where the main character dies two-thirds of the way through the song and it's just this insanely lavish sounding soundscape and like it's just broken apart by getty just sort of like it's soft vocals coming through and describing the afterlife and then the fucking final third of the song comes in and it's just like hey what if we did led zeppelin but better than anything led zeppelin ever did and it's like yes also also the the, the most important reason why hemispheres is a great album is that it has a naked man butt on the cover it's a naked man butt on a giant brain no less yeah. I, I mean I, yes it's, it's it's that is how big all of their brains are collectively in rush um also want to stick up for the like you know obviously the the first song and the last song are sort of the the totemic moments of that album that's the that's like my favorite instrumental ever by the way uh the final song on there which is uh fucking la villa strangiato i don't know how to pronounce that shit um but the two middle songs the trees and circumstances are still two of the best rush songs um just like they're they're tighter they're more traditional and they're just fantastic uh the the guitar shit in the trees rock on (laughs) yes so i've had a good week as for what i've been listening to this week i have a few shouts to make um I, inspired by a, a random offhand comment that you made, Jake, about, I can't even remember what the context was, but you made a really offhand comment. Oh, I was talking about Carly Rae Jepsen's emotion, and oh, we right. started comparing it to Fleetwood Mac's rumors for whatever reason, and that just made me really want to listen to Fleetwood Mac. Uh, so mm-hmm. I went back and I listened to Fleetwood Mac's self-titled record, because I haven't heard that. Hell Yeah. Yet. Uh, that's a really fucking great album. I mean, you don't need me to, yes, t- to tell you that, but it obviously lives somewhat in the shadow of rumors, which is a bit of a shame because uh, yeah. it's a it's a solid record in and of itself. And obviously it also lives kind of in the shadow of its biggest songs, namely Rhiannon, Say You Love Me, Landslide. I, I have um, the, the woman herself uh, in the room when uh, we were I, talking about Fleetwood and Mac self-titled. I, I don't um, doubt it. But yeah, I really enjoyed that. Um, I really, really, really dig that record. I am going to revisit Rumors, but I'm also excited to uh, revisit Tusk, which last time I checked... Underrated. Last time I checked might have been my favorite Fleetwood Mac album. Such a such a fucking Riley take. But oh I don't know because I haven't heard it in su- like years. So I it's am great. Gonna, I'm gonna revisit so and report back on also d- don't skip Tango in the Night also. No, I, I, um that's also <laughs> fucking terrific. Uh, uh can I just say it's so like I feel like last week you had an offhand mention of like how it's funny that our brains are constantly in sync in ways that we don't realize until we talk about on the recording and that I have been every day of the past two weeks um, been listening to the live version of Landslide that was recorded in it's in Melbourne, I think, that's done with like a symphony orchestra because that shit makes me cry like a fucking baby oh my god it's so good if you've never heard that particular performance oh man stevie just was was fucking on one i i have to dig into some of their live material because another really motivation good. for listening to this album as well is that i mentioned the the rivals podcast that steve hyden did mm. with uh his friend whose name i can't remember from rolling stone anyway is there uh, a rivalry with fleetwood mac well, it's a rivalry within Fleetwood Mac between Stevie Nicks oh. and Lindsay Buckingham. <laughs> and I think it was the first episode of that podcast. You could make they the did. case that there were a couple of those in Fleetwood Mac. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. The case but, for which is called Rumors. Well, exactly. And I think that's a reason why they decided to make the very first episode of the Rumors podcast on that particular rivalry. But I, I was familiar with it to the extent that it informs rumors, but I was not familiar with like the fallout of that rivalry and the way that it kind of affected mm. the rest of their music, culminating with Lindsay Buckingham's uh, firing from the band like <laughs> three years ago, um, basically at the insistence <laughs> of Stevie Nicks, who said to Nick Fleetwood that it's either me or him. Uh, 
and and they chose Stevie Nicks. Well, I mean, can you fucking blame them? It's just know, like, yeah, know, it's just like, it's like Lindsey Buckingham, Stevie Nicks. Oh well, gosh, well, this is a really tough. I can't lie. It's well, like, no, Nick Fleetwood's kind of, a great musician, but the kind of Stevie. ironic thing about it though is that when Lindsey and Stevie originally entered the band in 1975 they hired Lindsay and he said, I will only join this band if you also hire my girlfriend, Stevie, who sings with me in a duo. (laughs) And so the band agreed. So essentially it's this beautifully ironic sort of like bookend to that story where uh, Lindsay gets Stevie into the band and then Stevie 40 years later kicks Lindsay out of the band. (laughs) He's allowed to do it yeah exactly (laughs) meanwhile christy mcvee is just over in the corner like i'm also here yeah the one reason i mean there's many reasons why she's allowed to do it but the biggest reason is because the rest of the band bullied her into leaving silver springs off of rumors which by the way is a top three fleetwood mac song i did not know that for whatever reason and that's fucking stupid what the fuck were they thinking yeah silver spring well in the re in the reissues and remasters of rumors silver springs i believe has been put back on the album okay Uh, that's why i didn't know okay but but originally it was cut from the record uh and i'm like you do not cut Uh, anyway i'll i might talk (laughs) more about fleetwood mac uh next week or at some point in the future but i need to curb that off for now hmm Next thing I want to shout out is I am continuing my dive through the 90s records of one Miss Tori Amos, who I've shouted out before. We're going to be doing a record club on her debut album, Little Earthquakes, in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, I listened to her third album, Boys for Pele, uh, which is kind of like one of her most sort of notorious records. It's like 70 minutes long, and it's like her most experimental album it has like all a a lot of the tracks are like harpsichord lead but there's also like trip hop beats and like fundamentally it's the it sticks to the core of tori sound which is woman at a piano fucking wailing Uh, and you get plenty of that on my favorite genre album cover too it has a dope as a fucking (laughs) shit album cover Mm -hmm. great shout april it's amazing um but what I love about Tori is like with a record like Little Earthquakes, as you'll all see when we review it, that's like a fundamentals woman at a piano record. Like those are just like, this is just a woman banging out classic songs that are instantly just fucking canonized and just really, really fundamentally great. Whereas on a record like Boys for Pele, you're getting an album that is basically almost as great but like super esoteric, like even down to her, the way she composes songs and writes songs, the opening track on this record is eerie and strange. And, and one of the best things that I've ever heard from her. Uh, It's a, it's a real, like to me, a record like this and spirit and in compositional style is a big sort of like precursor to like artists like Joanna Newsom and Julia Halter, like in spirit, in terms of like taking fundamental sort of approaches to composition and the use of the female voice and just taking them into avenues that are completely unexplored. And so I reckon that uh, people who like Joanna Newsom and Julia Halter, who I believe are two much bigger artists and more popular now than someone like Tori is, if you like either of those artists, you'll love Tori because she does has the same kind of spirit in her music. Um, so yeah, big gets a she big- She disses aspect. Courtney Love. Yeah, uh, Professional Widow, <laughs> one of the like most absolutely insane. That, that song title alone, like, do you even need to have lyrics to a song called <laughs> Professional Widow? I mean, it's just like fucking buried. I would walk off the face of the planet if I were her. I'm well, done. This is the other thing about Tori as well, is that she's a messy bitch. Like, she is like not afraid. She gets compared to Kate Bush a lot, which is strange. And I think it's only because she has a kind of similar voice and vocal style to Kate Bush. But if you want to compare the two of them, like Kate Bush's Disney Channel compared to Tori in terms of like just just pure fucking like not giving a fuck. Like, I mean, the 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 chorus of Professional Widow, Widow is just basically Tori wailing star fucker just like my daddy over and over and over again. Oh, I love Nine Inch Nails. Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, and the song ends with one of my favorite ending lines of all time, which is give me peace, love, and a hard cock. <laughs> <laughs> anyway that's just Holy a taste of, fuck. of that of that um incredible record again as i say more to come on tori in the future <laughs> april i take it you're a decent fan of tori's early stuff as well 
Oh mm-hmm. God, I wish I could say I was. No, I have I not know. listened to enough Tori Amos at all. I've heard the first two songs off Boys for Pele, and I think they're absolutely incredible. Yeah. Just for some reason, never continued it. Yeah. And then the only other album, I'm looking it up on my phone right now because I don't remember the title. The only other album I've heard from her is from the Choir Girl Hotel. Yeah, that's the next one I've got to get to. I'm really looking forward Amazing to that Amazing title. As well. Um, but yeah, l- listen to Little Earthquakes. I mean, we're going to do a video on it in two weeks time if you need more motivation, but that record is a 10 out of 10. Next thing I'm going to, next things I'm going to shout out are actually two brand new releases. Um, neither of which we have slated to review, but, um, could potentially end up on this late if anything we have slated ends up over, un- being underwhelming. But in case we don't, I'm going to shout them out now anyway. Uh, the first is a really exciting and original sounding new Screamo record from a band called Foxtails. Um, oh, yeah. This album has I got been, the yellow flannel. I need to listen to that. Uh, this album has been generating a decent amount of buzz online. So I wanted to go and check it out. And this is like, okay, so it's Screamo with strings. <laughs> that, I'm that's, sold. That's what it is. Specifically with a violin. Like this band has a violinist who's like the kind of the core component of a lot of the songs. Sounds um, like angry yellow card. Cool. Well, it, it's like, it's like, how do I describe this? It's like Envy teaming up with fucking, I don't know, like. I'm listening. Just an orchestra, I guess. I don't know. Not an orchestra because it's not that expansive and, and huge sounding. It's definitely obviously a record from a, a small band created on a budget. But um, it's like an album that's less about like individual songs and more about kind of like this, the progression that it builds to. Like a lot of the early songs are quite short and fragmented. And then they save like this, these the really sort of heavy hitters for like the back half of the record where it really gets like, holy shit. So I think that sort of off-kilter structure that it has might throw people the first time they listen to it. But as a holistic singular experience, it's fantastic. I uh, highly, highly, highly recommend it. The other new release I listened to, the first great proper emo record of the year, is from a new band called Anxious. And the album is called Little Green House. If you like emo, if you like post-hardcore leaning emo, uh, if you like sort of just that kind of sort of quite cleanly produced, but really kind of loud and hard hitting music in the vein of uh, sort of more recent emo bands like Dog Leg, for instance, then you'll really, really dig this record. I enjoyed it quite a lot. Has some really hard hitting moments on it. Uh, Definitely, definitely recommend for the emo heads out there, a really, really solid record. Uh, And the last thing I want to shout out is a record that I, I checked out on a whim. And the reason I checked it out is because uh, a five-star review of it got front-paged on Rate Your Music, and so I was just scanning through the front page. I thought, oh, okay, this looks really interesting, and it's a sort of jangle pop record with uh, some of the most stunning vocal presence that I've ever heard on anything remotely approaching this genre. Parts of it reminded me of some of the vibes of the Cocteau Twins and parts of it reminded me of Life Without Buildings Uh, and the the album is called Reading, Writing and Arithmetic by a band called The Sundays and again never heard of this band not familiar with this at all Um, it's a record from the early 90s and I simply saw it front paged and checked it out on a whim and this absolutely entranced me from start to finish in a similar way that the life without buildings album does although this is much less kind of like punky and and aggressive and much more sort of just like languorous in these sort of jangle pop tones but the melodies are are super strong and just again i cannot impress this enough the the vocals themselves are staggering the vocal presence of this singer harriet wheeler is so unique and so captivating that you you cannot tear yourself away from her i mean at least i couldn't and the melodies and songs themselves are super super strong and yeah i I just found this record to be completely on 10 for me the entire way through and i was just never less than totally blown away by it which is crazy because it's a really kind of fundamentally simple album at its heart but it has just enough sort of nice wriggly complexity in some of the arrangements and again just that voice that just utterly angelic siren song-esque voice that also has a lot of kind of range and sort of wiriness in it as well 
can't recommend this enough the sundays i, really I gave that a listen actually and oh. i was surprising I, I enjoyed it um surprisingly enough i i had heard the the song here's where the story ends before i think that was a fairly successful single um just because i've heard that in like 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 retail stores and stuff before i was just like oh i i, I know this vocal refrain but yeah i had heard that before and it really caught me off guard i was like oh this is what this is from oh wow. shit I had no idea that 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 that, yeah, that, I mean, that song is an inc- incidentally like a, an immediate standout on the record, and mm-hmm. it's very very highly rated. Um, but yeah, just ugh. I mean, just listen to the first three songs on this record if you want a taste, because that to me is like the peak of the album. And uh, if you like beautiful music, then I don't REM meets say. Cocteau Twins. That's a good summary. Yeah, R.E.M. meets Cocteau Twins. Great, great album anyway. And anyway, that's really all I have to shout out. April, your turn. Yeah. If you have anything that you've been listening to recently, it doesn't have to be in the last seven days, but at any point recently that you want to shout out that you've been enjoying. I might as well talk about some stuff. Uh, it's funny because when I was invited on the podcast, I said pretty much jokingly, like, I need to have the hardest what I've been listening to out of anyone. <laughs> And I don't because I haven't been listening to a lot of music lately. But I do I do have some stuff. She's about to drop the hardest segment of all time. <laughs> uh, pretty much all electronic adjacent music. Go for which, it. You already yeah, got go. me. I think that's cool. Uh, the first one is probably the most overdue first listen I've had in months. Uh, because I've been fascinated with her views on music and politics and history in interviews, but I haven't listened to any of her music. And that's DJ Sprinkles, Midtown 120 Blues, which is a Deep House record, kind of about the history of Deep House, but it's, it doesn't love the history of Deep House. Like it's, (laughs) it has a, it has both a love and a hate for Deep House in a way I haven't seen an artist have this much reverence for their own genre and be this passionate about explaining and exploring the music they make in their genre in a record that other than this like this is one of the most important albums i've ever heard if you want to listen to deep house and it really helps that the music is fucking astonishing I've never heard of this before, April. You've put something completely new to me on my radar, which is so fucking exciting. Just every track is immaculately crafted. I can't recommend it enough, but... What an album you, cover. Whew. Unless you use Soulseek, the only way you're going to be able to find this oh. is through a book live stream. So... <laughs> okay. Maybe going to- I, I, you say this, and I am already on Soulseek as we speak. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I might be doing the same thing. <laughs> but yeah, that's dope as fuck. I need cool. more. I think I've been talking about a decent amount of like ambient sort of house and ambient techno music lately. Like I've been getting really into Ski Mask, for instance. So mm-hmm. this sounds like something that would be right up my alley at the moment. There's a almost infamous Madonna rant about two tracks <laughs> in that's just incredible. The second album I want to talk about is, well, it's not really an album. It's a DJ mix, which I never thought I would be talking about. But Live at the Liquid Room Tokyo by Jeff Mills is the first DJ mix I've ever listened to and certainly not the last. I think it's the highest rated one on RYM, which is why I checked it out. Oh, It's just this dirgy, disgusting sounding live out. Not really poor quality disgusting, but like... The atmosphere that traps you in is just hard to listen to by the end. It's very claustrophobic. It's Detroit techno. It's very repetitive, but it's really excellent. You can you can hear him like scratching the turntables and switching songs, and it's just oh, love that shit. It the atmosphere created on this album is something else. I, another thing that's completely new to me. So that's really fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah. I am down. Unfortunately, what I have as my last album, you have all heard of because you did an episode oh. on it. But oh. Oil of Every Pearl's on Insides by Sophie. Uh, oh. Not an album I wasn't familiar with already, 
but like one that's just recently been growing on me so unbelievably mm-hmm. much i i don't really have words for it it's just whew, face shopping <laughs> become one of my favorite songs ever what is there what else is there to say about that record i mean it's just so unapologetically in your fucking face and that i mean not to, to bring it back to us again but like that video that, that jake and i did on that album i mean i'm 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 super fucking proud of that because i'm glad that took off yeah I, i'm glad that because not not just because hey we made a cool piece of content go watch it but like i that doing that and that process of preparing for that and then recording that like helped me like and i've listened i had listened to this album like 50 times before then ever since the day it came out but like do with the process of really going through that and doing that helped me with mm-hmm. a lot of the things i needed to work out internally but also just like my own relationship with the album and like my own understanding of the record like a lot of the time when we talk about albums i end up kind of like understanding them in a different way through just talking about them and that really did happen with that album and god what is that if not the goal of this very podcast honestly i mean like that was that was a big one for me too i i mean not to make it sad but i feel like I, to the day we're recording this like death has been on the brain just because meatloaf unfortunately passed away but like and i believe i saw a notification saying that it had been a year just a couple of days ago but it's just like that the time you spend without an artist in your life that previously was in your life feels unreal it, it doesn't feel tangible it's just it, it's smoke like it's it, eh. art is weird like that man mm. and let's move on to our first main review of this episode which is Earl was a member of a collective at the very beginning of this decade called Odd Future, who were incredibly popular with the frat boys of America. They were sort of the the new wave of kind of like DIY grassroots hip hop combined with the fact that they were all so ridiculously young. They all combined various different styles. They were all very edgy. And, you know, it's just, you got the impression that they were super uh, cutting edge. Their, their sort of influence lingers on popular music now you can obviously feel their influence and stuff like the work of brock hampton they were kind of the group that paved the way for that but they never made any music that i feel like is really like them as a group have been way more influential than the music that they made if that makes sense like as a brand odd future was really successful and really took off in a way that like nothing really had before. And so we saw a bunch of people kind of emerge from a group like that. And they obviously became some of the 2010s most successful artists. We of course have Frank Ocean who went on to make stuff like Channel Orange and Blonde. We have people like Tyler, the creator who we've covered on this very podcast who went and made a fucking lot of albums. Uh, Domo Genesis, another very successful one. But I think the sort of underground slash critical darling has kind of always been Earl Sweatshirt. Uh, Just from his debut project alone, um, well, not technically, because that was Earl, but uh, Doris was really the first project that kind of got him on people's radar. Uh, And he displayed a really great understanding of just, you know, fundamentals hip hop, but also he kind of had that sort of like, you know, cutting edge new artist appeals to younger people, but also really kind of appealed to old heads in the same way that somebody like Mad Lib would, uh, just because he has a really great kind of crate digging, uh, not in the sense that he would like sample old things, but he would construct beats as if they were samples kind of. And I think that sort of approach to his sound is what made him so interesting. And Unfortunately, Earl's artistic progression is inherently kind of tied to the fact that he has had a very tumultuous uh, decade in terms of his mental health. We talked about this a lot on our episode on some rap songs, uh, where we kind of talk about how from Doris onward, he gets a little bit less 
tangible in the fundamentals of hip hop and becomes something that's a little bit more obscure and darker and weirder and blatantly misanthropic. His album, I Don't Like Shit, I Don't Go Outside is sort of the, the, the progenitor of this little wave of his artistic movement in that like, it's a like, it, it's very much like Doris in the respect that it's kind of accessible um, for him. Uh, but the content within is pitch black and frightening. And his EP Solace is another one that's kind of like that, except that's a little bit more like some rap songs, which is this fractured, weird kind of like, it, it, it's unlike basically anything I've ever heard, frankly. It's an album I'm still kind of in awe of that took a long time to properly grow on me, but it's a weird esoteric radio waves being channeled from the innermost depths of hell and then rapping over it kind of album. And then after that, he did release a project called Feet of Clay, which was an EP and then subsequently a deluxe edition of that EP, which was not as successful as anything else that he'd made, primarily just because he had gone so deep into that like progression of I don't like shit, some rap songs, and then this, which is like, it was mixed so aggressively like sludgily that it was like barely legible as an album basically I don't particularly care for that album even though I kind of respect what he was doing on it so I think everyone wanted to know it's just like so you've taken this direction this far what do you do after that if even anything because you know we don't know what the state of Earl is we don't know if he's interested in pursuing something different and now we have sick and that kind of answers that question and interestingly enough it is both a I wouldn't say it's a departure from what he was doing but I would call it a clarification everything here is definitely like it's deeply textural hip-hop it's really about how these beats loop and sound and feel and you feel like you can kind of like put your hands in it and just kind of move your fingers around and be like oh this is kind of Ugh. in a way that feels a lot more appealing and again legible than he has been in the past even like I would say that this is more accessible in the vein of something like Doris frankly and that it's just as short as a lot of his albums have been it's not longer than 30 minutes but still feels more complete and fully formed than something like some rap songs did, even though that album wasn't trying to be complete and fully formed. This is just something that feels a little bit more like this is Earl kind of getting back basics and doing his sort of what he built, made his name off of doing, but applied with the eccentricities of what he's learned since. Uh, and in my opinion, I think we have a really interesting end product. One thing I'll, I'll note off of the bat is that I think the thing that's kind of always been the draw for Earl relative to his odd future counterparts, well, for one, he was always generally regarded as the most technically skilled rapper in the group. Yes. Not that there weren't others, but he was always kind of like, if you go back to like Oldie, for instance, that kind of big gigantic posse cut they put out, like mm -hmm. when people think about that song, when they look back on it, they think about Earl and they think about Earl's presence in that music video and his verse as well. The way that you have a bunch of these kids kind of like goofing around and falling around and you have someone like Earl who like is in like, full school shooter mode <laughs> like <laughs> just genuinely get a bit concerned uh, and, and and a phenomenal lyricist just generally speaking like he has always been a very like again old hip-hop head appealing kind of dense poetic uh i mean Ar armand hammer features on this album that tells you all you need to know yeah exactly like so the appeal was always in the kind of like weird sort of dark mystique that he had like obviously frank ocean has his own brand of mystique but that's kind of like uh you know, i'm sad and gay yeah exactly uh... whereas earl is like has this kind of tragedy surrounding him this kind of cloud just genuinely concerned just like and, and he like... cultivates that i believe he oh, cultivates that. i believe that he leans into that and i believe that he uses that i mean i think particularly with i don't like shit i don't go outside the whole aesthetic of that album cycle and the singles and the sound itself was utterly nihilistic by design and so that's mm -hmm. created this sense of earl as this kind of captivating artist who whenever he shows up I, I think another kind of landmark moment in his career as well as someone who's kind of 
been following it actively the whole time is his verse on Danny Brown's Really Do as well, which I think a lot of people yeah. were talking about when it came out. And so he had these moments where he would just kind of disappear and then emerge and just throw some like utter fire down and then just completely drop off the face of the earth again. And so that's always, I think, lent whenever he brings out a new project, there's this sense of ceremony, which is funny because as we've talked about with some rap songs, his projects have been getting more and more formless and shorter and shorter as well, to the point where, I mean, there's very little line to draw between an EP and an album. Like, I, I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty sure Feet of Clay, is it longer than this album or it's about the same length or maybe I'm thinking I of the deluxe version? I think it might be. Um, but anyway, point aside is that, you know, it speaks to this notion that's getting more and more popular now in the age where music is no longer defined by physical media, where what an album is, is becoming less and less clear and more and more sort of nebulous to the point where artists like Earl can put out essentially anything and call it an album. Like he could put out, you know, <laughs> three six minute songs or something, and that could be an album. Um, and, and that's something that makes actually critiquing and reviewing a record in terms of like structure, it doesn't make it difficult per se, but it means that you have to be slightly like you have to take that into account when you review something like this. I think this episode is actually, oh, really, I was about to say this episode's kind of the theme of this episode is kind of like unconventional structured projects that you have to not think about as traditional records for various different reasons but anyway with sick it is and i'll say off the bat this is probably the earl project i connect with the least out of everything that he's released uh that was an unintentional rhyme uh, uh, but, bars <laughs> white boy got bars indeed i uh, went back to that I, I swear, unlike the Some Rap Songs video, I'm not going to just start reading full verses. I, I'm a little <laughs> disappointed. I really wanted you to. Uh, well, maybe. We'll see what happens. But anyway, um, yeah. So it's, it's the Earl Project I connect to the least. Um, but I think it's kind of like a slate clearing at this point for Earl, right? He's gone so far yes. down this rabbit hole of like these oppressively nihilistic and formless projects, culminating with some rap songs, obviously, that it, it, he's at an interesting point in his career where you can tell he kind of needs to reset the table. And I think that that's what he tries to do with Sick. It's a very low stakes record. It arrived with very little sort of fancier and build. And essentially it's just like, it's the most sort of animated and fun. I think that it sounded like Earl has had in a while, which is relative to Earl's previous music because he's still doing that kind of droney sort of like mono monotonous delivery but he is playing around a little bit more he's, he's extending his verses a little bit more he's doing things that feel a little bit more sort of like conventional to a certain extent than on some rap songs even though we're definitely pulling back from a conventional rap album here because you have so many songs that are like don't even hit the two minute mark and to a certain extent, this is a record where the first couple of times I listen to it, you're more drawn in by the instrumentals than you are by what the performers are doing. Because as is the case with a lot of this late 2010s abstract hip hop, it takes a while to process the subject matter. If you And you have to kind of enter the project with the intention of doing that if you hope to take anything meaningful away from it. Uh, at this point, I'd love to hear from you, April. I know that you're yeah. super into like this 2010s wave of abstract hip hop as well. I'd love to hear what your perspective is on an artist like Earl relative to his contemporaries, some of whom, of course, we have guesting on this album as well. And what you feel this represents for Earl and how you feel about the album as a whole. All the 2010s abstract rap is something I've been deeply into for the past couple of years and especially last few months um but earl is one that i've been into since i was 14 like i was to give away my age i was 14 when sub rap songs dropped so and that is the first earl album i listened to which is kind of weird because it isn't should not be the first earl album someone listens to it's borderline but, deconstructive i mean like it, it, it <laughs> 
it is like it, it, people should use the term experimental liberally, but um, that 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 works for that project. But I've been in love with Earl since then, so I guess it did something right. And same, I've gone back, I've listened to all his albums, uh, countless numbers of times, especially some rap songs, and I don't like shit. Mm. And all of his albums kind of feel like a progression to me. Like on every album, he's taking new risks. He's trying new things. The jump from solace to some rap songs even feels like a risk. Yep. Uh, even on Feet of Clay, he's taking a lot of risks. East is mm -hmm. a bad song. I don't like East at all, <laughs> but he is certainly remember. trying something on it. And he is on a lot of Feet of Clay, which is why it really, really hurts me to say that this album feels almost static. It doesn't feel like a progression, progression to me very little of the album feels like he's trying anything new but that's also not a bad thing because most of the songs on this album are still excellent i especially love tabula rasa with armand yeah. hammer yeah two of I my mean, favorite terrific. in the game right now so of course i do it hmm. almost makes earl the, he's been on three songs with them now it almost makes him feel like an unofficial member he gels so well with them and the first half of this album Everything before that is also just excellent. I love 2010. I love Old Friend. But I also don't love the second half of this album at all. I think it is unmemorable compared to everything that precedes it, besides Fire in the Hole, which is excellent also. But all the songs just feel shorter. Well, they don't feel shorter. They are, are shorter than most of the stuff on the first half. And he doesn't really get a lot across like he does on the first half. Yeah, I, I totally get where you're coming from, April, because I feel a similar way. I don't necessarily think it's, uh, I, I don't think it's like particularly front or back loaded. I think it's the stuff I enjoy most about th this record is reasonably well staggered across it. But I do think that, again, like it's difficult to review music that's purposefully formless because you kind of have to you have to meet it where it's at to a certain extent more than you do with like more conventional music you have to say like okay this is like fundamentally like these tracks are shorter they're less kind of like holistically you know dynamic and dense and and, and full of progression than we're used to from typical songs and so you kind of have to, like, for instance, a song like Old Friend, you kind of have to appreciate or approach on a different level to a song like Tabuta Rasa because they're like, one is four times the length of the other and it has like so much more detail and depth going on within it. And I think that kind of like, the Earl's ability to make these kind of fragmented pieces of music that are instrumentally compelling and leave a distinct impression on you, even if he's not actually adding much like do, rapping a whole lot on them. He masterfully did that on some rap songs and I think structured the album in a way that you were kind of pulled along through those different sorts of dark digressions and diversions between songs. Whereas I kind of have to agree that this record feels a little more slap shot to me. It feels a little more kind of all over the place. Like for me, the longer songs on this record, particularly Tabula Rasa and Fire in the Hole, really stand out as like particularly memorable and exciting and obviously more fully formed, but just generally containing more of what I love from the artists involved, particularly Tabula Rasa, which is by far and away the best thing here. I absolutely agree. Like uh, and, and a, a lot of that, Earl is great on it as well. Like Earl's rapping is, is absolutely bar none excellent across this entire record. But I will say that these sort of more fleeting moments, while they have like really, really strong beats in songs like 2010 and songs like Lie, for instance, which I think is another really, really great standout musically, uh, a great Alchemist produced beat on this record. But uh, yeah, as a song, it, it struggles to really sort of hold together. And I think that the shortness and brevity of this album as a whole really hinders it in a way that, because like some rap songs is a really, really short album, but you're cycling through so many different ideas on that record. You have a really kind of extended track list that pulls you through so many different distinct individual moments. This record is a similar length, 
but it has less of those individual standout moments. It has those shorter kind of moments brushing up against longer tracks, which make, which can't help but make the shorter moments feel less substantive by comparison. It honestly, you know, again, ironically, considering the other album we're reviewing today, it has the feeling of a mixtape or it has the feeling of some sort of collection of demos thrown together. And I get that as part of the design for Earl, but I, I just have to be honest that for me, it doesn't really lift off all that much. Well, uh, as the odd man out here, uh, I guess I will speak to the elements of this that like, it's it's weird just because obviously I'm going to come out of this a lot more positive. Uh, unsurprisingly, I kind of love the album. It's um, good. And it's good for this I, for this dynamic. <laughs> yeah, and but it, it's also difficult because it's like you know, as it's difficult to air out your grievances with an album like this, it's also kind of difficult to say what makes it special. Just because you know, it's obviously such an you know, it's a hodgepodge. I mean. I do what I have to do with the fragments is a lyric on here. And it's just like, yes, you've described your entire ethos in one lyric. Good job. That said, I find the sort of, you know, the table clearing, the, I mean, tabula rasa, ha, 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 ha. I see what you did there. I, I find it refreshing just because the sort of avenue that he went down with uh, some rap songs and feet of clay while i definitely think that's intrinsically linked to to who he is and that was a genuine artistic progression i also saw it as a i don't mean diversion in like the negative sense but i also like the reason i enjoy some rap songs is literally because it feels like someone's mental health has eclipsed their ability to make coherent music and i know that that sounds like a bad thing to most people but to me that's what makes that project fascinating it's like i don't digest that album the same way that i do contemporary hip-hop or even abstract hip-hop uh it's almost too abstract to be labeled as such and also with Feet of Clay, I also just figured that like, that's a project I'm not super into, but I think he kind of dug himself into a bit of a hole of like taking that sort of muddiness and, and going with it as far as he possibly can aesthetically. And now he's kind of pulled himself back up and it's like, okay, so where as an artist am I without these things encumbering me? And while again, that creates something that inherently is not anything new for him, is that it still feels like a recontextualized version of things that he's done in the past with the, the, the more seasoned efforts that making an album like some rap songs can give you. Basically the entirety of this album thematically is Earl evaluating the state of the world and the various systems that are designed to uphold, protect, care for people, specifically Black people, uh, that are currently failing. He is observing these and reporting them back. And again, Tabula Rasa is a great example of that. Um, but I mean, even from the end of a track like uh, my favorite thing on here, Vision, where you kind of get the, the spoken word piece of, you know, something that really like it, it kind of echoes the sentiment that Tyler, the creator, had on Call Me If You Get Lost when he has uh, that moment on, I think, Manifesto, where he says, tell these Black babies they should do what they want. It's a similar echoed sentiment here that Earl clearly believes in and is sort of like, it feels like he's coming at this topic with a bit of a vengeance. And songs like Sick, he's addressing, you know, the state of the world amidst, you know, sickness. And the way he distills his perspective, not only like sonically and, you know, these very traditionally textured, jazzy, loopy, you know, beats that personally I just can't get enough of. Like if if this is Earl on autopilot, he can do that if like beat wise. He can do that for the rest of his career as far as I'm concerned, because he's second to none at it. Uh, nobody is better at making these types of beats than him. And I think that even includes like modern day 2010s Mad Lib. Like he hasn't been able to capture the magic and the singularity that Earl has uh, as far as I'm considered when it comes to beatsmiths. And that's a lot of why I like this project is it because it feels like he's able to hone his talent without being having something hold him back like it did on some rap songs. It's just that, you know, that particular project, that wasn't a, a hindrance to him uh, as an artistic expression. Whereas here, he's doing it with a little bit more clarity. And you can see that it's like, this is an album that has to be made by the guy who made some rap songs, which is important because nobody else would make an album like that. And you sort of feel the kind of simultaneous push and pull of 
motivation to say something and make a difference that obviously we talked about on something like uh, some rap songs uh, where Earl has this really, really present pressure because of his uh, lineage, his parents who put like, like not even specifically they put pressure on him, but they were activists. They're people who, you know, they're these scholarly activist people and, you know, him existing and making art, he is inherently trying to live up to that expectation. And it really feels like here, this is his sort of attempt to finally be able to do that. Whereas his previous records were about his inability to do that. He's just like, I can't get past all of my mental shit. This, however, on the other hand, is him getting a step forward. And it feels, while not artistically like a progression, it still feels fresh to me. It's, it's enough for me. Even to, uh, to speak as to a little bit more on the beats of the album is that one song on here that I also just can't get enough of, um, my second favorite song, uh, on here, which is Vision, uh, featuring Z Loopers, uh, who's primarily like the, 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 has the forward momentum of the track. Like three fourths of this track is uh, Z Loopers on the beat. However, the beat itself is just fucking phenomenal. One of the best he has ever made. I, I find this slick and addictive and Z Loopers themselves has kind of an effect that they did on something like uh, by the time I get to the Phoenix last year where it's this dizzying spiraling flow that just feels kind of alien and despondent but it doesn't feel sedentary and it just it just scratches the exact itch that I want from a project like this and you all have spoken to the fact that you know the the first half of the album does definitely feel like it's more solidly built. It has a little bit more coherence. Uh, and I actually agree with that, except it's like, it's simultaneously both correct and kind of misleading to say this album has like a less substantial second half because the second half of this album is really the final fourth of this album because of the way the time actually works. There are, there's one song on here on the back end that's a minute long. There's an interlude that comes before that. And then a song that is like, you know, small-ish and then, you know, a larger song. So it inherently kind of feels wonky and I completely understand kind of feeling like, oh, but getting into this segment of the album feels inherently a little bit less, like there's less to chew on, lyricism wise too. Uh, and if the album has a weak point for me, it is the uh, lobby interlude that goes into God Laughs, which I like the sentiment on God Laughs and everything. And I like sonically what um, the interlude has to bring to the table, but they simply like, Earl is great at doing more with less. And it doesn't feel like that approach is really all that present on these two moments. Um, whereas I would argue it is on everywhere else on the album. That said, uh, I still think it ends like Fire in the Hole is both like a grand sort of finish to this. And like that kind of gives it the, the end, the slower kind of denouement that uh, an experience like this kind of deserves. Um, and just overall, like, I, I think that it's, it is inherently lower stakes, but I guess I'm just more willing to meet him halfway when it comes to, because I, I got so in the groove with something like some rap songs that the structure of his work just dissipates its bar for entry with me. Like, this is just kind of something I took it face value and that never ended up being something that was difficult for me to clear. I just kind of enjoy this as a contained singular experience. And given how short his projects are, I think that's kind of how it's supposed to be interpreted. Not that that makes it inherently better or worse, valid, invalid, blah, blah, blah. But overall, it just feels like Earl with a clarity that he hasn't been granted in the past five or so years that I think is refreshing and will pave the way for something perhaps a bit more substantial in the future, but there's nothing less cutting here. Earl is still a top form lyricist, a top form beatsmith, and this is him exercising the best fundamentals uh, and most fleshed out fundamentals he's had since I don't like shit, I don't go outside. It's just that that is an internal record and this is taking the internal and using it to contextualize the external. And that's why I think it's definitely uh, worthwhile and that more people should uh, check it out than it's been, it's kind of got that sort of muted release and I, and I get it, but also I've listened to this album like 
like 10 times in the past yeah. week just because I find it eminently like again Riley said it's it's comparatively like very listenable and and fun if you can talk about an album that's talking about the failures of uh you know systems in America amidst the the world ending fun um but it, it kind of is there's an irreverence here that I find kind of upbeat and he's got just like you know he, he's he's sharp tongued as ever and it makes it feel cathartic and incisive and I really like it contextualizing the internal with the external I think is what you said just before and I think that speaks to the kind of heart of this record pretty well like right from the album title uh there's obvious allusions well not obvious but there are like subtextual allusions to the pandemic and particularly to like sort of socio-cultural and socio-political aspects of the way the pandemic is affecting people of color in particular there's a quite ballsy line on the song vision where he's like fuck out of my face with that syringe where you he's like throwing at you this sentiment that a lot is expressed a lot in the black community of hesitance to embrace uh, a vaccine or a medical thing that is pushed in the in their face by the government because of the decades and, and centuries of like medical mistreatment and abuse that the government have inflicted on the black community. I mean, you think of Tuskegee, for instance, like that's all subtextual, but there are some interesting socio-political illusions that Earl makes at certain points on this record. I kind of wish, if anything, that he dug a little more into them. Like the thing with this abstract style of hip hop writing and performance is that, you know, it demands a lot of you as a listener to kind of unpack the layers of metaphor and wordplay that are often going on, uh, very oblique references and subject matter that's often kind of quite opaque. Uh, but so there's an art to like evaluating what the quality of a verse or the quality of, of uh, lyrics in this regard, because you have to really you know dedicate time to that and so I can't with a lot of certainty and confidence say you know exactly which verses really really like I really 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 think are great compared to just all right I will say though generally I think that again it may just be that I haven't unlocked some core cool level of this but to me this is some of Earl's least focused rapping um, I, I do wish he'd spent more time kind of unpacking certain subjects as a real sort of stream of consciousness, formlessness, quality to his verse construction, as well as obviously the music itself that, you know, I am at least currently held at a bit of a distance from. But then again, I felt similarly about some rap songs the first few times I heard it. So who knows what might change in that regard. Uh, it's just nice to have Earl back and I want to see him continue to pop up on projects from... Uh, the artists in this sphere I'd love to see more music from him I mean you look at artists like Armin Hammer who are ridiculously prolific it would be nice to see Earl put out more music um, but we'll see what happens Earl collab with Billy Woods challenge release he's already been on he, they, they already yes. happen it's just we need a full record of it is all like bread and butter yeah I mean exactly like even if he just made the beats that's that's album of the year right there. Yes. My three favorite tracks are, uh, let's see here. Let's go with Vision, Tabula Rasa, and 2010. Least favorite. Part of me is just like uh, picking interludes on albums like this is uh, lazy, but also I don't feel bad about it because the interlude is as long as other songs he's made. So I'm going to say the interlude just because it doesn't really it does, just doesn't really add all that much to the project overall but then again it's you know effect is kind of negligible and it's that short so eh, eight out of ten it's a strong project in my opinion all right my favorite tracks are uh old friend tabula rasa and lie uh my least favorite track is probably god laughs and i'm gonna give the record a six uh, my three favorite tracks would probably be Tabula Rasta, uh, 2010, and Fire in the Hole. Lie would probably be my least favorite track if I can't pick the interlude, which I don't want to because it is an interlude. But I think I'm going to give the album a six. I'm hesitant. I kind of want to bump it up to a seven, but where I'm at with it right now is a six. Alrighty. And August has given it a five. 
<laughs> obligatory August moment. And so that gives us an average of 6.3. Moving on to our second review of the day. And we are, of course, talking about... Talia Barnett, frequently known as Twigs, is a musician who has made a lot of waves in the 2010s with her particular brand of R&B influence inflected electronic pop music. She has, she really came onto the scene in the early 2010s with her a series of untitled EPs, as well as her debut record LP1 which made a huge storm I think in retrospect looking back on the decade it's easy to see that as a super influential point and the broadening out and sort of more sort of cultural embracing of really angular electronic music in the context of R&B in the context of pop music in the context of alternative pop music in general uh, Twigs has been incredibly influential and she's always stayed true to her particularly idiosyncratic vision for art as well. I mean, reflected in the multimedia uh, experience that was the Melissa EP. And I think that was 2015, 16, maybe. I want Notably, to say. that is my favorite EP of all time. Really? Yes, it Somehow is. Somehow I didn't know that. That's nuts. That's awesome. I I oh, adore great. that project. And I uh, the fucking the, the first song on the Melissa EP is just the oh god, I could I could talk about that EP for fucking hours. Figure eight's just the, the uh, fuck. Well, what's fuck. really what what's really interesting about Twigs is within that EP and the video component that went with it. And going back to LP1 as well, but also even trailing further into her most recent release, 2019's Magdalene, you know, oh, her, heralded as her masterpiece immediately on arrival. She has visited themes of, I don't know if body horror is the right way of phrasing it, because that's a bit kind of too extreme, although that element is definitely in some of her work. But well, the thing about Twigs, right, like her name comes from the fact that she's a dancer who has like contortionist abilities, who's able to kind of manipulate her limbs and and just kind of create, turn herself into this kind of like monstrous creation, which is something she's done in a lot of her art. And this new release, Capri Songs, uh, which is a mixtape, incidentally, not an album. If you're not clear on the difference, there is a difference. We can get into that. But um this is like notably a much lighter and more sort of breezier and less, I guess, intense affair than her previous work. But in its structure, it is the project of hers that flirts the most with new genre experimentations for Twigs as an artist, for new visions of what she can be in terms of a, a pop figure, in terms of a figure across various genres of music. And so it's weirdly like, if you have this visual contortionism that she's engaged in within the confounds of her like angular electronic R&B and her previous music, this is kind of like musical contortionism, this mixtape. It is twigs like just melding and turning herself into whatever kind of figure she wants to be. You have flirtations with Latin music on this record. You have flirtations with much more aggressive stuff. You have flirtations with much friendlier stuff. You have all kinds of different colors and textures and visions of who Twigs can be as an artist. And so I think that's the kind of way in which this fits into her development because the first time I came across it the first time I imagine a lot of people came across it it's kind of bewildering as a release from Twigs because it seems like such a sidestep uh, from the kind of eerier darker sort of more violent music that she'd been making up to this point the more fragile music maybe is a better way of putting it that she'd been making up until this point and yet the antecedents of this particular sound and style and, and more kind of boisterous approach can be seen as far back as songs like Two Weeks off of LP1. It's just that as a musical artist, she's continuing to expand the and, and just kind of break down the limits of how she's considered. I mean, she started doing that with Holy Terrain, the future collaboration on Magdalene, which everyone was like, what the fuck is this song? What is it doing on my FK Twigs album? Hey, have you considered that it slaps naysayers? Have you considered that it goes <laughs> fucking hard? 
And now you that? have this entire project full of these kinds of holy terrains, for lack of a better word. And this is where the distinction between mixtape and album, I think, becomes really, really, really important because an, an album is a distinct, cohesive vision, a, a distinct, cohesive statement that represents, uh, generally is, is made to represent the next kind of development of an artist's you know, sound or image or personality or artistic you know, it's the next artistic progression, is the next full artistic statement. A mixtape in the context of music is, I mean, it can be a lot of different things. It can be a place to just throw together ideas that don't fit onto an album. It can be a place to release music that your label doesn't want you to put on an album because it's too out there or whatever. It can serve a lot of different purposes. It can be a way of create of putting music out there if you're a new artist but you don't yet have like a label uh supporting you to release a full album you can put out a mixtape and you can get your music out into the world in that way so what a mixtape is again it's kind of a nebulous term it can mean a lot of different things but it distinctively sets itself apart from a, a fully realized cohesive album project which might invite you to say well then you know, isn't that kind of just making excuses for underdeveloped and less kind of conceptually unified music? Isn't this just saying like, oh, well, it's actually good that it's all of these things because it's a mixtape. And that's where the true core of what Twigs's idea of a mixtape is here really comes into relevance, which is to say that Capri songs is twigs again like i said expanding the possibilities of who she is as an artist giving you all of these different visions of who she can be of where she could take her sound of how she could become this huge pop figure and kind of letting you experience all of these things at once she frames it as a gift from her to her listener like the very first thing you hear when this mixtape starts is i made you a mixtape uh because what did she say because when i feel you I feel me and when I feel me I feel good which is kind of creepy but fine um, <laughs> but yeah so this is this is essentially Twig saying here is all of the shit that's in my head here here are all of the things that I'm playing with and here it is for you crafted into something you can consume and I think that to treat it and, and, and denigrate it purely for not adhering to the standards we hold to an album is kind of unfair but anyway that I think is important context to establish what this is. April, I think it would only be fair to jump to you next since you went last kind of on the Earl record. What's your relationship with Twigs? Uh, how, what are your kind of overall feelings about her music? And what are your feelings about this particular mixtape? I have a almost weird relationship with Twigs because I listened to Magdalene when it dropped and I thought it was absolutely incredible. Spoiler alert, I love this mixtape. But I like Magdalene even more. I still am fascinated by that record. And just, I had never gone back and checked out any of her other music until last week preparing for this. And all of it is pretty great, I think. Um, everything is, a lot of her music, to use the word you said, Riley, a lot of her music sounds fragile, but at the same time, it has this powerful undercurrent to it that really bolsters all of it. And this mixtape feels different, which that's not at all a bad thing. Maybe it's just because I'm personally connecting to it lately, but I can't get enough of this mixtape. I have been listening to it nonstop since it dropped, which is great because I was not expecting to like it based off of the single that dropped, but the if i'm kind of disappointed this released in january because it would be my sound of the summer if it came out in the summer yeah um, i was confused about that i was listening to this and i was just like i mean i kind of get it but like why isn't this coming out in like june <laughs> <laughs> hmm yeah just banger after banger <laughs> uh on this mixtape i i've been playing darjeeling i do have some problems there are some oddly british interludes <laughs> that, uh, that definitely breaks the flow up of the album and i can't stand honestly love love yourself in it <laughs> uh, there's certainly some songs that are weaker on the album but on mixtape 
But the songs that hit, and I do think most of them hit, really, really hit. I just can't get enough of Capri songs. This might end up being my favorite FKA Twigs album. But mixed, you, you know. Project. Project. Yeah. Project. Yeah. Oh, okay. shit. I, I, I can totally see where you're coming from. It's a ridiculously fun record. And yeah. it's so like, it's simultaneously sort of like carefree, but also like really fast paced in terms of the ideas that it's throwing you through. Um, some absolutely re- some real standout songs here I love and there are songs that I love for just like simple little things that are like you know it's like some of these songs are like clearly throwaways but they're enjoyable in spite of that and sometimes even because of that like I really dig uh, the second track here Honda because I, it's yeah. not like a particularly fully formed or like amazing song but I just love the little kind of vocal things that she's doing on it there come baby baby come yeah, little, it like, sounds great it sounds immaculate like actually that's a good point like production wise there's a there's a lot of like really sort of lush and, and collisions of sound that are happening on a lot of these songs that do feel like they're staying very true to the kind of cutting edge musician that twigs is and producer it should be said there are other moments like meta angel that i love as well like that's mm-hmm. another absolute standout on this record for me yes where you get this real sort of diversity and variety and mood and texture and timbre and palette for twigs and also in vocal effects and uh, production and mixing as well one big comparison i keep coming back to and it's quite obvious but i because of it's obvious that i would think of this because of my particular taste in music but i do think that twigs is kind of channeling it to a certain extent which is the influence of charlie xcx on this mixtape i think is frequently found and on songs like meta angel in particular other songs as well like um shit which ones were was it like oh my love it comes up in as well these kind of vocal effects and timbres that she uses and i think back to 2017 when um charlie dropped her two mixtapes number one angel and pop two that was kind of like my first kind of coming to terms with oh these aren't albums these are mixtapes and starting to kind of understand what that was and I think that those two, particularly Pop 2, are kind of like a gold standard for how to do like a really effective mixtape. Uh, Capri Songs, if it has one kind of major limitation, is that it's quite lengthy uh, and it feels its length. It has a lot of different ideas that are being thrown at you. And just as by the nature of that, you're not necessarily going to respond to all of them in equal measure. Um, so it's not necessarily that this has structural flaws because again it's a mixtape you can't apply structural criticism in the same way as an album but there are ideas and songs here that don't particularly connect with me as much as others I don't really care for well any of the interludes I find little moments like Pample Moose and Light Beamers to kind of be kind of varying between irksome and just downright annoying Uh, that said there's a lot on this record I do enjoy I really like the tracks I've already mentioned early in the record as well. I think Oh My Love is particularly strong in the first half too. Uh, But the second half has some really great sort of hooky tracks that I really enjoy. Like Jealousy is a song that's grown on me quite a bit because it has this really addictive and quite strong hook. Minds of Men feels like classic FK twigs in certain respects, but also like the future as well. It's one of the record's most beautiful moments. Um, Songs like April's already mentioned Darjeeling, which I will agree is the best song on this album. Yeah. An absolute standout with great features from Georgia Smith and Unknown T and a, a really addictive sound. I could see this being a top tier twig song for me once the dust settles on this. Uh, one thing I will say is, um, and I think that uh, April's already kind of like presaged this with her comments about the advanced single for this album, Tears in the Club, which is kind a kind of, it has one of the best beats on the record, but it also is kind of one of my least favorite songs in the album as well. It just, it's kind of, look, serious face for a second. Twigs has obviously been through a lot. I don't even want to bring it up. The shit that she's been through, the tough shit she's had to endure. Um, that said, the hook tears in the club because your love's got me fucked up is like the most hilariously underwritten hook for a song that I've heard in some time like it's like it has this placeholder lyric kind of like 
nature to it and every time I listen to the song I'm just like that's really the best you should come up with for your song's hook for your lead single and it, but I don't hate it I, I don't like have any ill will towards it it's just kind of like okay and, and and it has the most like uh autopilot weekend feature yeah like, that's what I was gonna say it's why like, why do you put let me I oh that man I I I have I'm I'm very I fall distinctly right with April and uh Riley's thoughts on this granted but this song in particular which I think is a fine song how do you get FKA Twigs and Abel Tesfaye you get two of the most talented vocal presence in the world of pop music and you don't utilize their vocal chemistry you don't even attempt to do a harmony between the two of them really yeah Are you fucking kidding me and like everything the weekend adds here from his oh oh oh's to his like actual <laughs> verse is like it's like an ai generated a weekend feature <laughs> on a song like it's so just absolutely <laughs> anonymous like it's so just like, like <laughs> and i don't hate it again it's fine it's just like it's kind of funny riley noted weekend hater <laughs> Well, I mean, we, we, we really went to the dredges last week with Dawn FM, and I don't intend to bring that up again. That said, other moments I really enjoy, like uh, Twigs has this ability of like, when sh she often, when she wants to, can be incredibly sexual. I think of songs like Pappy Pacify huh. from her early EP too. I think of songs like I'm Your Doll from Melissa and she's ability to like get sensual but in a way that is like distinctly kind of uncomfortable uh -huh. particularly in the case of I'm Your Doll um, and she does this real kind of like sex jam here in the song Poppy Bones which obviously alludes to Poppy Pacify from her early EP too um, and this is essentially like you know a song where she's kind of singing to Poppy uh, and it's like it's it's very sexual and very kind of like you know um I, I kind of feel a little bit uncomfortable listening to it. And that's, I think, a testament to uh, Twigs' kind of sensuality and her ability to, I think, make men feel distinctly intimidated. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's a great song, though, in spite of that. Like, I, I like it. It's just like, there's this ability, like, when she's, even when she's being incredibly sensual, you feel a little bit terrified of her. Like, even just calling the song Puppy Bones as well. Like, you're just is are you is that like a real sort of tongue-in-cheek why, why are bones involved well no why? it could just be a really tongue-in-cheek innuendo like puppy bones yeah. me or it could be that um <laughs> I can't believe i just said that or it could be like yeah sh she's like creating a contrast between like the sexuality of puppy and like the the the, the kind of mortality evoking image of bones anyway <laughs> that's not a fully thought through thought that i just had Anyway, I, I dig it. Good song. The worst thing on this album by far is which way? Yeah, thank you. I'm glad. There you, we go. I'm glad you <laughs> didn't even have to like. I, I knew it right. <laughs> like, just it's yep. so annoying. It's short at least, but like yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's so like just grating. Uh, the vocals are grating. The feature from dystopia yeah. just absolutely leaves no impression whatsoever. And the most memorable part of the song is that fucking annoying refrain of i had a good job and i left i left because i thought it was right left right left right which way to go and, and then you have this outro to the song where twigs is doing this thing where it's like um oh there's that whole thing on twitter about uh, i want to be a rock star's uh, girlfriend and the difference is like i'm the rock star, the rock which, star. Is, which is fine as a sentiment right but the funny thing about it is like she repeats this like three times as if it's like this incredibly complicated idea that we're all really struggling like, to get our heads whoa around. we gotta take a minute to you're process a girl? this you're, notion you're a girl doing you're a girl <laughs> rock star <laughs> and girls like music what <laughs> um but like the funny thing is she just sees this over and over again and she's just like do you get what i mean and it's like <laughs> it's like i'm like no please explain it to me again <laughs> and i'm reminded weirdly of um <laughs> noel gallagher and like uh oasis no, and be here now where, where they had that song do you know what i mean and that's essentially the whole do you know song. what i mean yeah versus someone like 
Let's get ta. Versus someone like Danny Brown who can make a whole album out of the sentiment. Know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, it's just a little bit. Look, it's just a moment on this mixtape. It's not substantive, but I do like every time I listen to it, and I listened to this four times this week. Every time I got to that moment, I was just like, shh, shh stop. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's enough uh not to uh, mention the yeah. interlude where you have her fucking astrologist uh, telling her about how no. amazing her pluto oh. moon is this time of year <laughs> like that's the other thing like i get that the whole there's an overarching theme here which is like uh astrology i guess she's a capricorn it's called <laughs> capri songs uh when it was kind of there was like before this was dropped i think the working title <laughs> from it was capri sun like the, the juice i was gonna I say my idiot ass thought it was like the fucking drink capri I mean, sun. Also that's that. what i thought it was this whole time no but she's like you don't get it you don't get it she's a capra sun she's a capricorn and sun or whatever i don't know i just I don't i don't get it uh it's too gay for even me but yeah <laughs> that's yeah I probably just haven't gotten the chance to talk about her as an artist a, a whole lot on the show or just like mention her. But I mean, I already said that the the Melissa EP is uh, like my favorite EP ever. So, I mean, I love FKA Twix. I love basically everything she's made, like uh, EPs, like back to like EP one and two to LP one shit that i just absolutely am over the moon for magdalene included i i think that's her biggest and like best you know proper uh album and I, i'm just so interested to see where she's going to take her sound because her sort of alternative r&b art pop blend is so unique and uh, uh, what also helps, I mean, like, she's sort of a, a heavy hitter in both respects in that she not only makes albums and music that generally sound immaculate, you know, that fragile, ornate beauty that all of them uh, have a beholden. And, uh, like, with stuff like uh, her EPs and LP1, she collaborated for most of the production with Arca, who, you know, we've obviously talked about a lot. And you have these really expansive, but also really mechanical kind of things backing up her uh, voice, which Twigs is my favorite working vocalist. I cannot get enough of her voice. She, I, I will be real with you. She could release the most mid album of all time. And if she's doing good uh, vocal performances on it, I could give less of a shit what she's saying on it. I'll probably love it. I'll listen to it like 20 times just because this is like, this has an X factor for me. That's it's, it's silken. I adore it. And I really like how she's able to kind of flex it on this mixtape in a way that she really hasn't before. The cool thing about this is that uh, Riley kind of mentioned earlier that like, you know, you have the excuse to throw out a bunch of things that might not work on an album or something. And she does that, but like to a degree where it's like, to me, this is sort of like the version of like, th this is the accessible version of FKA Twigs. Cause like, she's got this art pop glitchy kind of impenetrability to her other stuff that's a little bit like like if you want to get your friend into fka twigs this is the project to do it just because this is a pop you know mixtape but this is a pop album this is an album that takes from the contemporary pop scene more than it does anything else it doesn't really have all that much in common with her previous sound which you know admittedly again is just another thing that kind of gives this a bit of a ceiling for me uh, I do think that it's, you know, it's pretty enjoyable front to back. It's pretty fun. It has a lot of momentum to it. It's just like the excuse that she has to take her sensibilities to a mainstream pop sound. You know, it, it's a really, it's, it's, it's as appealing as that might sound. There are things like the skits, which kind of, you know, they break up the flow in a way where it's like, yeah, I get that this is a mixtape, but also if they were gone, this would just be better. So I don't really feel like that that's an unfair critique. So it's already kind of lengthy. It's so just, that's it's, just it's just because we hate British people. That's all it is. That uh, look, look, look. I'm not saying that the British accents on here annoy the shit out of me, but I hate them. 
I hate <laughs> listening to them. I, I I deleted them off of like I listened to them the first way through when I heard the album for the first time. And because this is a mixtape, I don't really feel bad in doing this. Is that I hid that and which way from my library and just listened to it that way. And I'm like, okay, cool. These are really like upbeat. They have a spirit that her previous music doesn't have, and it's like it you know, it's both a good thing and a bad thing and that it sacrifices some of the appeal that she's had in the past. And that if you like her for these very specific things that she does, these very niche things, you might not necessarily get this, but the clarification it's a mixtape definitely helps set my expectations there. And my overall, like the most consistent complaint I have is that like production wise, they treat her voice very well and a lot of the production decisions work very well. But in isolated moments, I feel like the percussion on a lot of the moments on this album sounds just a wee bit dry. And that again, might be because the mixed tape nature of this, and it doesn't hinder songs that I love. It doesn't take songs from being good to just okay. It's just something that I'm like, I definitely miss the kind of more refined edge that the production of her previous music has. And this just doesn't, this particular part of this sound doesn't hugely work for me. But again, that's also just kind of something that's a bit secondary when it comes to your overall enjoyment. And, you know, uh, I won't get into the nitty gritty details, but Riley did kind of allude to the fact that Twigs has gone through a lot these past few years. And even if you disregard the obvious awful shit that she's been put through and you take her, like the fact that her last major project was an album like Magdalene, which if you listen to Magdalene, that is an, that is a self exorcism. That's an album that is, you can tell is just like, it's pure heartbreak. It's just like song after song after song and her detailing in gritty detail her feelings on basically the autobiography of the fallout of a relationship and you know after you make a project like that I can kind of understand why your approach to your next project is a bit less serious where it's a bit less fun and I get that like the spirit which she's making this to be something that like to bring people joy to make herself happy to make people happy to have fun to experiment to do stuff like this I I appreciate that because artists could just come along and make a mixtape and just be like ah, it's a bunch of songs whatever fuck but to me this strikes me as a genuine moment for her that while I don't enjoy this as much as any other project of hers I've heard as a matter of fact I'd say it's probably my least favorite project I've heard from her but that said it's still something that has thought and effort and love and craft put into it and where most artists wouldn't and I appreciate that and I get what she's trying to do with it like as a statement she's taking advantage of the mixtape as an art form as to where you know if you were doing this as an album, it would suffer a little bit more. Whereas the rough edges of this are being used to, to up the fun factor, to experiment and, and be a little bit more wild and be a little bit more accessible and warm. And I, I appreciate that. I, I enjoy this thing uh, pretty um, immensely. It just, this kind of thing just has a ceiling with me. I, I can only enjoy something like this so much. But that is to say, I don't think that a project's fundamental frivolousness should be something that's necessarily unappreciated by people, especially when it's so thoughtful, I guess. Yeah. Let's go into our favorite tracks and ratings for Fugger Twix, Capri Songs. <laughs> April, why don't you kick us off? All right. Uh, my favorite track, as alluded to already, is Darjeeling. I think that track is incredible. Yeah. Um, then probably Ride the Dragon in Jealousy coming up next yes i love both of them i hate to be the only one who's not gonna say which way is their least favorite track uh, <laughs> somehow get this weird sick twisted enjoyment out of that song uh but i think my least favorite is probably tears in the club just because of world's most forgettable weekend verse and uh am i gonna do that i've listened to this enough times and i appreciate it enough to where i think nine out of ten would be my rating well hell yeah let's fucking go um uh, my three favorite tracks are indeed darjeeling uh meta angel and oh oh my love my least favorite is which way and the mixtape gets a six from me six point five 
for me. I got to say my three favorite tracks. Uh, unsurprisingly, favorite is Darjeeling. Uh, and yeah, Meta Angel, definitely. And I'll also say Ride the Dragon. I really enjoy that as the opener. It's really energetic. It's really fun. Uh, least favorite, which way? Uh, and if not, just substitute any time a British person is speaking and not singing on this album. Uh, I, I hate all of them. Uh, they should they should stop. Uh, stop talking, all of you. Um, uh, I'm not a fan. Um, and I give the mixtape a, uh, a 7 out of 10. All right, that is a 7.5 average. At home, let us know what you think of either the Earl Sweatshirt sick album or the EFK Twix Capri Songs mixtape. Let us know what you think of either of these releases in the comments below. We want to hear from you. We do genuinely like hearing other people's opinions on the shit that we review. If you enjoy the video, please hit the like button. Uh, if you are not already subscribed to the channel, please consider hitting the subscribe button as well. If you like what we do and you want to support us in a bigger way than that, you can also hit the join button. And for just a dollar a month, you can support the channel, be one of our family members and get additional perks such as priority responses in the comments and the ability to request music. As always, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Capri Sun, respect the pouch.